Exactly. It, it, it is a privilege and a pleasure to welcome all of you to this Nurses' Voices Speaker Series Session 2, Nurses' Voices from the Western Hemisphere. This Nurses' Voices Speaker Series is an innovative global platform to celebrate, discuss, and share the voices of nurses from across the world. In these turbulent times, we are remembering and calling for more of nurses' attributes, courage, caring, commitment, compassion for suffering. May we learn more and take away more of the value and significance of these nurses' voices and heed their calling for healing, resilience, and advocacy for a better world. And now it is my privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Carolyn Ortiz, who will open our session with a traditional Mesoamerican ceremony and invocation, welcoming in the seven directions and inviting us to gather with a generosity of spirit and a peaceful heart. We are, we are indeed medicine for one another. Carolyn. Thank you so much. So as we gather together today, I don't know why, um, I want to say thank you and in so much gratitude for this opportunity to be with you and to be here in, in your company. And I offer you an invocation and a call to gathering. As it was taught to me by my elders, and my teachers in curanderismo of the Mesoamerican tradition. Recognizing and acknowledging that it is only one way and that there are many other equally correct ways. And if you can see over my left shoulder, I do offer the incense and the smoke of the copal as a gift and an honoring of our time here together and of all of those who join us in the different forms with which they do, but all, all united in love. We welcome the East, Quetzalcoatl, the place where the sun rises and clarifies our path. May we live enlightened lives. We welcome the West, Xipetotec, where the sun sets and the moon invites us inward. May we welcome change and growth with ease. We welcome the North, Tezcatlipoca, honoring the knowledge and wisdom of our ancestors' gift of medicine May we enjoy balance and well-being. We welcome the South, Huitzilopochtli, and like children, knowing all is possible. May we be curious, courageous, and kind. We welcome Father Sky, Donatiu, the space of limitless expansion. May we live expanded lives. We welcome Mother Earth, Tonantzin, the nourishing ground that receives, cradles, and gives life. May we blossom and flourish. And finally, we welcome our own heart, corazón, the center of our soul self with our unique gifts. May we live in harmony, sharing our gifts.
And with this, we are complete. Omete. Oh. Carolyn, muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a powerful way to begin this session to Nurses Voices from the Western Hemisphere. It is now my privilege to welcome the co-moderator of this session, Dr. Cheryl Van Dalen Smith. Cheryl is a Canadian national and regional nursing leader and educator who currently serves as Associate Dean of the Faculty of the Graduate School at York University. It, in her downtime, she and her husband keep a ranch that looks after rescue animals. I am most grateful to count Cheryl as a very dear friend and colleague. Cheryl. Thank you, Diva. I love you right back. It, it is a pleasure indeed to bring greetings from Ontario, Canada and from York University School of Nursing, where we have intentionally woven social justice, health equity and advocacy directly into our curriculum. Nurses witness much and are left with the privilege of speaking up and speaking out about health and health care. Indeed, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario implores all of us to do just that. Nurses are pattern noticers, truth tellers, listeners, processors, and discerning decision makers. We see the downstream implications of upstream structural and societal causes. And we ask ourselves from wherever our vantage point is, how can I make a difference? When student nurses ask, who me? Nurse educators respond, of course you, and show examples and exemplars of nurses affecting change. When bedside nurses ask, who me? Nurse researchers say, of course you, and show example after example after example of bedside nurses seeing, speaking, acting, affecting. There's something so compelling about this series hosted by Nye and CFAL, focus on focusing on nurses' voices. Oh, sure, it's our hands we've relied upon to contribute to healing. It's our minds we've relied upon to contribute to decision-making, policies, practices. But it is our voices, our individual, our team, our collective voices, wobbly at times when fear tries to shroud conviction, that propels us to speak truth to power, to ask tough questions, and to offer solutions or calls for change based on what we've heard, seen, experienced, or witnessed. The nurses today, and in this entire session, including Dr. Diva Marie Beck and Dr. Barbie Dossi, founders of NIE, have made conscious decisions to use their voice, for they know, as do all of us in nursing, that students, practitioners, researchers, ed educators, retired colleagues, that this tool of our voice is in our professional tool belt is the one that can be offered in equal measure of humility and steadfast conviction because we all just want to make a difference. So let's sit back and drink in the voices of today's offerings of nursing's global voices. We're just so glad that you've joined us. What I'd like to do is just briefly introduce our speaker now. That's um, Dr. Donna Nikitas, Dean at Rutgers University School of Nursing, where she leads Southern New Jersey's preeminent nursing school offering from programs from baccalaureate to doctoral levels. She's a noted national expert and she's used her voice for decades to make a difference. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for that wonderful introduction in, of your words as well. Greetings, colleagues from the Western Hemisphere, from the city of Camden, located in New Jersey in the United States of America. It is my distinct honor to be your keynote speaker today for the second in this series. Let me begin by thanking our co-sponsors, Zipal, York, at York University in Toronto, Canada, and Nightingale Innovative 
for Global Health Nigh World. I remember sitting in a meeting in the United States when Dr. Barbara stood up and talked about launching this campaign. And look, we are around the world today joined with one voice. Thank you all for that vision. Also, I'd like to acknowledge my fellow speakers who are with us today. We are pleased to have you with, with us as we harness our collective voices in sharing our concerns, compassion, and commitment to nursing and, and nurses and nursing for global health. But before I begin with my prepared remarks, let me share with you a recent essay in the New York Times by Brad Solberg titled Stopping Resistance to Change. Solberg is the author of The Master of Change, How to Excel When Everything is Changing, Including You. I thought I would quote a bit from this essay because it reminds me, me, a nurse, a nurse who is always changing. After all, I think of myself as a change agent with lots of agility and agency. And maybe some like you who also are listening today. As professional nurses, I do not think we have a choice not to change. We may not like it, but it is who we are. It is in our DNA. In fact, COVID-19 proved that we had to change to even thrive towards survival, and yet many of our peers did not. And for those who did not, let us hold them in our hearts as we call them from our memories in this global moment of global silence. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus talks or tells us that you can't step into the same river twice, for you aren't the same person at each visit. And the water is ever flowing. It is powerful to represent the reality of impermanence. Everything, after all, is always changing. Yet so many of us have fought relationships with change. We deny it, we resist it, or even attempt to control it. The result is always a combination of stress, anxiety, burnout, and certainly exhaustion. I am here to tell you today that it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, I am purposeful not using PowerPoint today so that you will listen to my voice. It is the reality of the purpose of Nurses Voice Speaking series, and I invite you to listen, acutely listen to my voice here today, maybe a little teacher voice, in fact, as I ask you to reflect upon my words as we talk of change, and we've heard it so often in just a few minutes of our introduction, I think every speaker used the word change once or even twice. And I would add an additional C while we're at it in our working title of concern, compassion, and commitment. And how about substituting courage for concern? as it takes real courage to change. No doubt that change can and often does hurt, but it doesn't have to be that way too. In fact, Stolberg suggests that with the right mind, change can foster growth. Remember, change happens whether we like it or not. We may deny it, resist it, even attempt to control it. 
And that is why I'm committing courage over resistance. So let me share my secret sauce. To move through change with courage is to recognize that there is stability in change. Staying stable through the process is merely sometimes finding your footing, finding the ground that holds you up while you spread your wings. The birds have it right. They just keep moving. And so we must move as well. When we think back of how we needed to thrive and not just survive through the pandemic, what were we actually experiencing as thriving was stability because it was a process of ongoing change. So what is change? Change is about balancing acceptance with problem solving, the goal of living and learning to respond to change, not to avoid it or fight it, but actually engage it. To be clear, let me say again, this is not easy. And in a bit, when I share with you my responses to some of the guided questions that were provided to me, I'll tell you the truth. It's like every day when I to do my to-do list, which I think in my own perception creates some type of order, a plan to guide me. But even when I have a plan and I hope to achieve it all on any given day, that doesn't happen. It happens because of change. The best is to go through with the flow and release the rest of the universe. It's simple, it sounds simple, but of course, some of us don't like to let go. I learned to get comfortable with change because what science tells me, if I don't learn that, to let myself go and experience change, I experience greater distress, the opposite, greater chances of disease. In some cases, individuals experience death or demise. So here we are. In a moment, in our own discipline, we can promote health and well being, but often we, we don't practice what we preach. Remember, I'm not preaching to you today, but rather ampli amplifying my own voice to remind you as well as myself that we must go back to the river to change. Let us remember the Greek philosopher who reminds us that the only thing that is constant is change. Remember where I started, that I know most nurses have a large amount of agency within. But this is a way that we can simplify our normalcy in creating the expectancy that change will always go somewhere. So let's lead it. How then can we stop for now in this moment and reflect? When you're in change and it seems overwhelming like a tsunami, stop. Think about what's happening in that moment. I love when we began and we took a moment to celebrate this time together in a pause of meditation. So when change happens and you cannot cope, that's another C, be present and experience the moment and say, what am I doing now? And is it the best that I can do? And what if, I ha what if I have other skillful actions that I call and bring forward, forward in this moment? Actually, you can do all of the above and repeat it. And eventually you get better with change, growing your own personal agency. So let me talk a moment about my professional development as an academic leader. I think that's why you invited me. <laughs> and a policy advocate. What requires a little bit of roughness and flexibility. Remember those words, I'll come back. Mixed with a whole lot of grit and persistence. And I fa in fact, I am convinced that when I hear the words of my own colleagues who are on this panel with me, 
they will talk about their own grit and persistence that got them to this moment in time to be with all of us. So let's begin with the roughness. To be rugged is to be tough, determined, and durable. She says it again, you gotta be tough, definitely determined and durable. So for those of you who know me, who are joining us today, you know that I'm an Italian American, born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. You probably picked that up from my Western Hemisphere accent. I am also a Taurus by birth sign. In other words, I am tough. I am determined and durable. I say this because I know my core values. So to be tough, I am a woman of faith. I wake every morning with a moment of prayer and meditation, thanking the mighty who protects me. I remember that I am part of a family, whether it's my blood relation family or my nurse family and the food. So I, being an Italian American, food is very important to us. To us. So I use faith, family, and food as part of my own cultural grounding and core values. I know that I stand for health equity and social justice through policy and political activism. So on the other hand, I know flexibility when I have it and when I don't, but when I'm flexible, flexible is the ability to be consciously responsive or respond to alternating circumstances or situations to adapt and bend, and bend easily. Yes, let me say that again. Bend, bend even when I do not want to or even change my mind. Because when I change, I'm looking for a win-win as a better than a loss win. And if I master change with a little bit of gritty endurance, I become stronger in my fragile moments. And whom I am among that doesn't have fragile moments. So my courage today, rather than concern, is we think about how to thrive, not just to survive. We transform our relationships with others, with change leaving behind the rigidity and the resistance and in favor of more flexibility and ready to accept what life has in store for me and for you. Returning to the river, knowing who we are, who you are. We are not the same person at each visit. And now I would like, like to take the time to remind you of my story of being a nursing academic with you. Here are my prompts. When I ask, and we will have time, I'm sure the moderator will give us a chance to talk about one another. So one of the questions that I was asked, where are you currently working? Well, I told you, in New Jersey, of course, at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, which stands among America's highest ranked, most diverse university, public universities, the found, it was found, it's an older university founded in 1865, the largest and top public rank university in New Jersey, in New York, metropolitan area. We are the ranked number one in the public university sector in New Jersey by US News and World Reports. We have over 67,000 undergraduate and graduate students and about 585,000 plus alumni around the world with $929.3 million in research grants and sponsored awards. When I focus on why I'm here with you today and why I wake up every day in my office coming to Rutgers University is because I have an awesome responsibility of preparing the next generation of the nursing workforce. 
of clinicians, educators, and scientists who are civically minded and socially responsible for engaging and advancing health equity and social justice. I view nursing practice as meeting individuals, families, communities, and populations where they are. And I ask, how can I help? That is what you are learning to do by being part of this forum with us today. And so what motivates me is that I wanna be a change agent, go back to the change and know that being a first generation student, like many of the students who attend Rutgers University here in Camden, we know that first gens can make a difference. And so the challenges for us for nursing in our own workplaces or in our community is to understand the communities in which we serve. And so my constituents are my faculty, my staff, my students, and this campus. As a large urban public university, we have lots of competing priorities, like all large bureaucratic organizations have with limited resources. You have to be astute manager, that's what I'm called to do, and be an authentic leader who can negotiate hard choices, yet be equitable in the outcome. Easy no, challenging yes. And so as I end, I think the I'd like to leave you with remember where we started from. When you begin, you have to know what your priorities and strategies are. And as my work as a chief academic nurse officer involved in looking at the work that we've done here, our strategic priorities are four. Improving the health of the communities in which we serve, advance inclusive nursing science and evidence-based practice, promote visibility in our voices by sharing our story, and enhancing organizational effectiveness. I do my job because I know I have the responsibility of this community. I know I should be at my time at 15 minutes. I wanna be mindful of the other speakers. Thank you colleagues for giving me the opportunity to use my voice and to amplify these words with you today. Thank you. Uh... Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you so much. You've set the tone for this session in a mighty and wonderful way, and indeed for the entire series. Thanks again so much. My pleasure, and thank you. I'm just gonna leave you with a little quote as we oh, move okay, please. And that is, Daniela Barbie writes, be around the world, be around the light breakers and makers. The world shifts and the game shakers. They change you, break you, open you, uplift and expand you. They don't let you play small with your life. There and these heartbeats are your people. These are your tribe. Thank you for being my tribe today. Oh. God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. And we, with that, we have our next tribe member, our our friend, uh, and returning to the Caribbean, to welcome Rosemary Josie, a leading public health nurse in the Bahamas, and vice president of the Commonwealth Federation of Nurses and Midwives. Welcome, Rosemary. We are looking forward to hearing your voice. Good morning. Good afternoon to everyone. It gives me great pleasure to speak to you briefly about some of the challenges we face as nurses in the Western Hemisphere during the COVID-19 pandemic and the future of nursing from my perspective. I am Rosemary Josie from the beautiful island of Nassau in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. I worked in the clinical setting at the Ate Public Hospital managed by the Public Hospitals Authority as a nursing officer. I am humbled and grateful to be given this opportunity to participate in the Nurses Voice Speaker Series 
in collaboration with the United Nations Institutes for Training and Research, CIFAL York at York University and the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health. I love nursing. It was the best career choice for me, being able to care for people at their most vulnerable state, helping to save lives and yes, suffering with them and experiencing feelings of empathy. I conclude that nursing is my calling. As I speak to the future of nursing, I forecast that the future of nursing in the West, Western Hemisphere will encounter some severe challenges and setbacks if our governments don't see the need to invest, retain their nurses for the future of nursing in their respective countries. Nursing challenges in the workplace and the community are complex due to the increasing demands of the workload in the workplace and the chronic staffing shortages in our healthcare institution. The nursing shortages and the migration of nurses are of major concern in the Caribbean and the Commonwealth countries. We are experiencing a brain drain in comparison to the wealthier developed countries who are experiencing a brain gain as a result of the migration of our younger generation of bachelors and master's degree prepared nurses migrate into their countries for personal reasons, better salary and career opportunities. If measures are not taken to invest, retain and rejuvenate our nurses, we will lose them to wealthier nations. In regards to our nursing education and training, many countries from the Pahu region have made significant progress than others in the education and training of their nurses at a bachelor level, as the entry level registered nurse program with the support of the CARICOM and regional nursing body. However, there are still some countries offering certificate diploma for the registered nurse programs to meet the demands for nurses due to the critical shortages. Efforts are being made in collaboration with PAHO to support the standardization of midwifery curriculum and a regional midwifery examination. Additionally, at the RMB level, the standard of nursing education and nursing practice are being reviewed. At the Caribbean Nurses Organization level, there is a collaboration with the International Council of Nursing for the development of a regional leadership for change program for nurse leaders in our region. The Caribbean Nurses Organization has also expanded its continuing nursing education offerings through a partnership with the World Continuing Education Alliance. When we look at our workforce, the nursing workforce in most of our countries have been experiencing challenges over the years. Many of our nurses are silently crying out with a need for decent, safe working conditions, which includes stability. However, there are still many who are afraid to speak out due to fear of victimization, and there are those brave nurses who march in the streets, using their collective voices to draw attention from their government, employers, and political leaders to plead their cause for better working conditions and pay. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has been exhausting and an added stress both physically and mentally on the well-being on many of our nurses and has taken its toil on those working on the front line. Nurses were discouraged and experienced burnt out. They express feelings of hopelessness, anxiety, and sadness, and the fear of death was real to them. They felt like they had no voice and were thrown out into the unknown. However, in all of these trials and tribulations, we became like family, lovingly supporting and praying for each other well-being. And as I conclude, globally and regionally, nurses are faced with serious issues that threaten the delivery of safe nursing practice in our communities. Therefore, we need to speak with one voice in elevating and prioritizing the role of nurse leaders in strengthening the regulatory framework policy related to global health for nursing and mature free. The Commonwealth Nurses and Midwives Federation endorses the right of each nurse or midwife to migrate from one country to another following the, the applicable laws in their home country and their destination country. 
Also, we continue to work in collaboration with our partners in supporting young people for a safe, secure, happy, and healthy future. Thank you so much for listening to my voice. Uh, thank you so much, Rosemary, for, for sharing your voice and giving us a, a bird's eye view of the Bahamas and the Caribbean and the, and the phenomenal work you are doing there with your colleagues and for serving the Western Hemisphere and the world with your voice and your courage. Thank you so much. And now it is my privilege to turn to the Southwestern United States to welcome Dr. Jose Castillo III, uh, who is a certified registered nurse practitioner and a professor of this topic at the Texas Wesleyan University. I recently met Jose during the planning of, of a project to develop and uh, develop and promote the voices of nurses and nursing students from diverse cultures. It was a privilege to meet him and collaborate with him. And so now it is a privilege to welcome you, Jose, and your voice. Thank you. Can, Jose, can you speak? <laughs> ah, Ali, can we help Jose speak? Ah. Yes, I'm, I'm checking that to see what is. Thank you for your patience, Jose. There we go, thank you. I apologize. <laughs> I should have asked Ali earlier. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good noon, or good evening, wherever you're at. I'm in Naples, Florida, but I teach remotely for Texas Wesleyan University's Nurse Anesthesia Program. I am very honored to be amongst esteemed panelists. I am so overwhelmed by everyone here. <laughs> I feel like I'm uh, in front of celebrities or something. I am extremely shy. <laughs> but thank you so much. I, I hear what Dr. Nikita was saying about com comfort with change. And I truly understand that that's what COVID-19 brought forth for all of us to be more rugged and be flexible. I really like that. I took notes. I am going to write about that in the next Florida Nursing Quarterly. <laughs> and also with um, Ms. Rosemary Josie's comment about the brain drain and the brain gain, because as Florida um, Board of Nursing Chair, we see applicants from the Bahamas, and I truly understand what you're talking about. We also have nine nurse anesthesia programs here in the state, and approximately around 60% or probably around 50% only stay as anesthesia providers here in the state, but we are also as addressing with that brain drain or brain gain kind of deal. But anyways, I am very amazed by all the perspectives but um, I'm happy to share you my perspective. I am Filipino by background. I am a foreign graduate uh, from West Visaya State University in 1994. I have practiced nursing in the Philippines and I immigrated here in the United States in 2000. And I was able to practice in all settings, I hope. <laughs> I really like to take a taste of what I liked and what I didn't like. And when I was exposed in 2002 in the operating room, that's when I realized that I wanted to be a nurse anesthetist, and that's what I've been practicing since 2007. Ever since then, um, I also became very interested in education, so I went forth my PhD, and now I am a tenured professor at Texas Wesleyan University, which I am very proud of to be a member of. So with my diverse background and experiences, it catapulted me now to where I am at and what my main mission is. And... You know, when they say like, what, where do you see five years from now or 10 years from now? I have no idea at that time. But during COVID or around COVID, I realized my mission was in public service. As a nurse, I am usually asked, why are you in the medical profession being a nurse anesthesia provider? And I always say no. Our MD, DO colleagues are going through the medicine route. I went through the nursing route. I am very proud to be a nurse. I cannot negate the background, the holistic approach, and all the approaches that we do as nurses in our profession. So as an, as an advanced practice leader, 
let me explain why public service. Um, I do think that we need the recognition of our work as nurses. We are so undervalued. And this poses a major challenge in the workplace and in the communities that we serve. Uh, what I have found is that to actively participate in legislative advocacy efforts and regulatory oversight could be one of the solutions to this challenge. For all we know that if we don't have a seat on the table, we become part of the menu, right? We've seen and heard that so many times. As an advocate for our nursing profession, I volunteered and served in 2020 as president of FANA, which is the Florida Association of Nurse Anesthetists. We spearheaded legislation for an autonomous APRN practice, which we garnered for primary care with autonomous nurse practitioners in the state. Having led that, I thought that I am always encouraged to represent. So I encourage everyone here to be a representative of something. And with COVID-19, I think that cannot be negated or th that can be wiped out of our memory. For as someone said, never let a crisis go to waste, right? For some, they say, never let a good crisis go to waste. So we rose to the occasion during COVID-19. We had a huge shortage of ventilators. So I represented the anesthesia, pro anesthesia prevent, uh, profession at the Florida Department of Emergency Services. We educated and deploy and plan to deploy our anesthesia machines with ventilators to hospitals or and even plan to ship them to ground zero in the Miami Convention Center and around the state where they are needed. I also represented in the surgery center to ICU resource groups since elective surgeries were canceled and I'm part time so I got for load during that time. So of course, what am I going to do with my time? Volunteer, right? <laughs> The group completed a plan to convert ambulatory surgical centers to ICUs. And up to this date, we are so proud about that plan. And it is now ready to be mobilized, hopefully with not another pandemic in sight, right? Also when the first round of vaccines became available for our 65 and older communities, I co-led with another volunteer uh, for the Florida Nurse Volunteer Program, where we recruited more than 3000 nursing volunteers throughout the state, throughout the 67 counties, and we ramped up over 1 million volunteer hours administering vaccines. I traveled to these counties, four of them, we administered vaccines and met with legislators and emergency management leaders, making us visible, making us at the forefront of the pandemic. That was truly, I think, one of the best experiences in my lifetime. In my regulation role, role now and as current chair of the Florida Board of Nursing, we deal with issues that are old and new. Um, we have Operation Nightingale, and for those of you uh, here in the U.S. and even abroad, we deal with that constantly with the proliferation of the fraudulent transcripts. And even the ones that had the fraudulent transcripts that are now RNs and practicing RNs in our workforce. My job is not only to uphold public safety, but to motivate our nursing board always to rise up and persist to the challenge and move the mandate of protecting the public forward, onward, and upward, always, all the time. Furthering my work in nursing regulation, I got elected with the NCSBN, which is the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, on a whole new another league, in regulation to serve and protect the public as the underlying mantra is the strategy that guides my mission in life, which is to serve the public. So in closing, I think you know where I'm leading with this, is that I want to challenge everyone in this webinar to volunteer, to contribute and to participate in whichever level you are at. You are not just a nurse, you are the nurse. You are advancing the profession. When I encounter a barrier to volunteering, contributing or participating, I always remember a quote by my mentor from Henry Ford, where he said, whether you think you can or you think you cannot, you are right. And I believe that I can think, I always want to think I can. We are visible through our participation as nurses in these various avenues and our contributions to the well being of our communities, our provinces, the state, country, and the world is recognized. We all think our efforts are very small, but remember that even though we are only a drop of water, I always love this analogy, when we combine our forces, we can be a very powerful river. We can carve through canyons and challenges, and we can effect change. Finally, please let me convey my thank you very much for everyone in this panel and to all who are listening in my native tongue. Madam, good luck. Uh, Jose, 
for a guy who claims to be uh, have to be shy, you're you are doing you are exemplifying a lot of courage and commitment. And thank you so much for your words and for sharing the phenomenal and awesome projects you are with and serving, and for your uh, admonition to us to continue. Thank you so much, Jose. Now we get to go back to Canada. Uh, with, sorry, and French Canada, to introduce Sharon Taylor, a retired nurse leader and administrator with more than 30 years of experience in leadership, clinical, project and change, change management. In 2018, she was awarded the Montreal Canadian Hero of the Game for serving some of the sickest babies in Quebec. Premature babies at 23 weeks, newborns in need of heart, or brain surgery and children born with complex and chronic conditions. It is an honor to welcome you, Sharon Taylor. Bonjour, mon nom c'est Sharon Taylor. J'ai travaillé 30 ans à le Centre universitaire de Santé McGill à Montréal, Canada. Hello, my name is Sharon. I'm a registered nurse, retired. Uh, since a year, and I worked uh, 33 years in the uh, McGill University Health Center. My uh, trajectory of nursing was very different from most nurses. I didn't take, um, well, why I became a nurse was after the epidemic of chicken pox in my toy box and all my dolls had band-aids, I figured nursing was what I wanted to do. And I have been 33 years a nurse and didn't regret a day, even through the pandemic. We would show up to work every day and, and I loved it. I've retired now, but um, as Josie said, I think we're going to be looking maybe to some volunteer work. Um, my professional development was very different. and We've spoken about change. Uh, almost all the speakers have, have mentioned change. I was a change management advisor for a transition of a, an entire hospital. We built a new facility in 2015. Um, we moved from a hundred year old building uh, with 150 beds, pediatric beds, into an adult facility, uh, state of the art technology. Um, and I can tell you change, seeing the teams from the moment where the decision was made to move seeing the teams mobilize to actually actually get the job done. And, and the patients were moved without any problems. The facility was not, um, was not an easy task for the nurses, especially to give care because the technology was changing and they had to make sense of where they were working. And it was tough. But I was always so impressed with how much commitment the teams had in just making sure that the quality of care was not compromised through the move. So that brought me to, after doing that for many years, um, I spent the last six years of my career as a nurse manager in a 52-bed NICU, tertiary quaternary care unit. And I have to say, it was the most rewarding experience of my life, probably the toughest, personally. But Working hands-on with the teams and then being hit by the pandemic. Um, for those of you who know uh, neonatal intensive care units, it's filled with very, very passionate people. And the interdisciplinary, um, just the partnerships that are created because you may be six people around a tiny, tiny baby, but you all need to work together. And, and it struck me. So... In preparing for this, I said, what are the three lessons I've taken away in a 30-year career? Well, I had to, actually, it was hard to come up with three, but Donna mentioned change management. Change management is one of the most important things in healthcare because there are so many changes. And I fear the change now with access to care, cost of care, the looming resource, uh, lack of resources, is going to is going to come to areas where they're going to be competing, competing for time, competing for resources. Changes will be uh, initiated and perhaps not as well planned as they should be. And I feel like planned 
change at the top if done well and you engage your frontline workers to be part of the change the change the chance the change will be successful is so much higher and i saw that through five years of planning a hospital move i saw it with clinical practice changes in the NICU i saw it with the pandemic when we were thrown uh, directives from the government to change the ways of working in a matter of days we had to turn around the educators, the frontline nurses, the physicians, the respiratory therapists, everybody worked together to try to make sure that the quality of care would not be compromised for those tiny babies. In my career, I have seen uh, change and unsuccessful change, which was very costly, and people picking up the pieces after uh, not knowing which way to go, but putting their heads together to work together to plan it out and look at the context of the change, which I think is very, very important. We know that we have a lack of resources, so context, you, any change that's going to be implemented has to consider the fact that you're not going to have the resources. I don't think the problem with the shortage of nursing is going to change overnight, so any changes that are implemented cannot be resource heavy. The other thing that I learned, a theme that was um, common in my career, was teamwork. And teamwork was such, I, I saw healthy teams and I saw unhealthy teams. And the teams that were healthy were able to work with less resources because they used their time efficiently and they supported one another. I think the pandemic brought out a lot of, a lot of problems with teams that perhaps weren't working well to begin with, and then it was just heightened with the pandemic. And I think teamwork is something that institutions will have to, to work on to be able to move forward in this context of, of lack of resources, lack of money, environmental changes, political changes. Um, I think teamwork is, is, there's no I in teamwork. And the third thing for me that is that I saw throughout my career was leadership. And I'm not talking leadership at the top with the, with the CEOs and, and the nursing leaders. I'm talking about leadership from the bottom. Staff nurses who were able to advocate for patients in such a courageous way, talking to um, physicians who the medical model was the only model and having to challenge ways of being and talking to parents who during the pandemic, uh, the terrible, terrible time that they had sitting in a unit where everybody is masked. All you could see were eyes. You couldn't see expressions. You couldn't, you saw that the, the workers were exhausted and all they're hanging, hanging on to is hopefully the team will be strong enough to take care of my baby so I can take them home. We saw this on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I felt like leadership was probably uh, the most important in, in listening to what the nurses had to say about what was working and giving them a chance to express themselves in a time when it expressions had to be very short and we, the resistance to any change was going to be very, very problematic because we had no choice. Perhaps going forward, uh, we will allow those voices to be heard um, because there is very strong leadership at the bottom. I can tell you, uh, I learned uh, humbled by the courage and the work ethic that those nurses had coming to work every day because not only in the pandemic did they have to take care of their, they had their professional responsibilities, but they also had families. 90% of the nurses across the globe are women. Of those 90%, most of them have families, young families. So during the pandemic, they had to worry about their own families um, and they would come to work and it was, it was very humbling to see them come to work and focus on getting the job done despite being exhausted and uh, burnout was starting to was starting to come to the forefront and they would support one another. Um, I just felt like leadership was really pivotal in helping us get through it.
we worked very closely with other team members and I felt nursing being a strong voice and, and in number two, there was more nursing. They brought a lot of very valuable lessons to the table. And I saw this as a nurse manager with frontline nurses. I also saw it during the hospital move. I saw it as a clinical consultant with, uh, I worked with teens in crisis. I saw that listening to the voices was very helpful in moving forward. So I thank uh, this forum for allowing this to, to allowing us to share our stories. I find it very, very comforting to know that, well, we're not the only ones in Canada going through this problem. It's around the globe, but it's also very, very concerning to know that, boy, we've got a lot of work cut out for us because it's a scary reality. Um, I would just like to close in saying that we didn't need a pandemic for people to tell us nursing were heroes. We did not. And every day they show up um, and do their jobs. And hopefully going forward, life will, will get a little bit easier for them. But in my experience, some of the problems we have today existed 20 years ago. It seems to me every nursing conference I've been to, nursing recruitment and retention has been on the agenda. So now the pandemic has allowed it to be highlighted and we need to work on it. The other thing um, I'd like to say is if somebody was to ask me, would you become a nurse again? I would say absolutely. I had the most stimulating career anybody could have had. I mean, it was perfect for me because I had attention deficit disorder. So that was kind of a a catch-22 for me, but it's a wonderful career. And I think young nurses who see the opportunities, you can move all over, you can work in industry, you can work in schools, you can teach, you can consult, you can do so many things. So people who are feeling fed up and feeling stuck, just look around. There's other things. Nursing is a huge, huge profession. And um, I think most of us on the panel today can attest to that. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Oh, you're so very welcome in the pas de quoi, Sharon. And uh, thank you for your uh, for your commitment and your advocacy and your passion for nursing and everything you've shared that we will be listening to again and again, those of us who are needing to be doing what you have done. Thank you so much, Sharon. Now, now, <laughs> We, we will welcome back Dr. Carolyn Ortiz, who represents the Latina nurses and nursing educators across the Western Hemisphere. With her commitment to serving people through her cultural lenses and through the integration of traditional healing practices with Western medicine. She is a distinguished graduate of the Intergrave Nurse Coach Academy, Inca, and represents Inca's sponsorship of the Nurses Voices Speaker Series. Welcome again to you, Caroline. Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos. Mis más sinceros saludos a todos que nos este que nos acompañan en esta en esta en este evento. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Soy Carolina Ortiz. Uh, good day, good evening uh, to everyone. Thank you for for coming and being here and joining us. My name is Caroline Ortiz, and I have a really um, it's a very personal story, though, uh, you know, apropos to this conversation about um, the journey that I was on and continue to be on that um, that is following along the lines of what Dr. Nikitas introduced was you never return to the river twice because you're always a different person. And this is um, certainly true in my case, where I I'm, keep returning to the river, and each time I am a different person. Um, I grew up and was born on the border with Mexico in deep South Texas, an area called the Rio Grande Valley. My mom is a nurse um, and worked a lot, so I was often between my home with my mom and with my grandmother, who lived down the street, I was also always sick. I always had tonsillitis. Um, so 
if I was with my mom, I'd go to the pediatrician. If I was with my grandmother, she would take me to the garden and pull herbs out of her garden or rub uh, alcohol on the soles of my feet. For sure, used a ton of Vicks Vapo Rub um, on me. Um, or would take me to her friend down the street, Doña Panchita, who was the local healer or curandera. And for those of you who may be, um, who may relate to this, I had a lot of barridas con el huevo or the egg limpias. So this means a lot to a lot of people who are in the know. It's like that. Um, and as a kid, I didn't know the difference between going to the pediatrician or going to, you know, Doña Panchita down the street. It did feel different. The experience was different. As I became um, more sure that I wanted to pursue nursing, I very much thought that I wanted, as many of my colleagues here are saying, you want to give back, you want to serve, you want to help. That was too my desire. And when thinking about who I wanted to help, a lot of it centered around people like my grandmother, because as I saw that they used a lot of their traditional healing practices or traditional medicine, at that time, it was thinking that they were superstitious. They didn't have the money to afford real medicine. So they turned to these practices as sort of what else you can do when you are lacking. Skip many years down the road, I discovered holistic nursing, I discovered nurse coaching, and I discovered a whole world of um, therapeutic modalities, mind body practices, and was so excited to learn them all. I think I worked to just pay for more and more classes and trainings and conferences in that area, just really finding that it resonated with me. And then thinking when I got into uh, my PhD work and what am I going to study? It came to me that all of this time, all of this effort, all of this interest was learning the traditional medicines of other cultures, but I knew nothing about my own because I had relegated that the healing practices of my grandmother and of my community back home was superstition. I didn't think of it as medicine. And so that took me into a whole world of, okay, so let's research that. What was all of that that, that they did? And it, yes, started out as a very academic exercise, but it has turned into an incredibly deeply, profoundly personal journey into coming back, not just to my community, but coming back to myself in ways of feeling connected feeling rooted with just so much reverence for the knowledge and the wisdom that has continued across millennia. And this is really what lights my fire. And so I've, I've studied it, I've continued to apprentice and that journey will never be done. Um, I present to to all of you, all of us nurses who work with communities that perhaps do practice traditional healing ways. And many, many do, but very, very few will talk about it. I'll just say that. Very few will share it with clinicians or with healthcare providers. But I'll propose to us all that we Continue, that we approach our patients and even ourselves sometimes, I still use the egg, um, with an open mind and an open heart and an understanding that for many people, traditional healing practices 
may be because they lack access to allopathic care or they lack access to um, to medical doctors or perhaps they lack funds to pay for it but for many many others and i might venture to say the majority at least from my research this is what i'm getting that these traditional healing practices continue because they are culturally appropriate it speaks to their heart and because they're effective and so with this idea that we become more knowledgeable in the traditional medicine of the communities that we serve and in those that we aim to help let us approach it again with open minds open hearts lots of listening and lots of love muchísimas gracias thank you so much omete oh, muchas gracias caroline for sharing this particular story and component it's so appropriate for our nurses voices from the western hemisphere a wide swath of the western hemisphere with your with your remarks and sharing we learned a lot i learned a lot thank you so much muchas gracias now now we have traveled to south america and brazil to welcome dr isabel amelia costa mendes a leading nurse educator at global regional, national, and local levels. Be uh, she is an awesome, uh, wait, well, be sure to read her awesome uh, bio posted on the chat platform. I was privileged to meet Isabel at WHO meeting in Africa in 2008. And I'm grateful to share that we have been friends ever since. Isabel is one of the leading Portuguese speaking nurses of the world. And we have been privileged that Isabel serves as our Portuguese language advisor for the Portuguese version of the Nightingale Declaration for a Healthy World. May I introduce our dear friend, Isabel Amelia Costa Mendes. Isabel. Thank you, Diva. Boa tarde a todas, enfermeiras e enfermeiros que falam português. Buenas tardes a todos, todas y todos enfermeros hablantes de español. Eh, good afternoon eh, to everyone. On behalf of Red Edit, I am happy with the invitation of the organizers uh, to share the with this audience. The, of this remarkable panel about the leadership of uh, an experience of a group of editors concentrated in this network whose identity uh, represents in Portuguese, uh, uh, the Portuguese and Spanish language in terms of scientific editing or scientific publishing in nursing. Um, in the in the field of uh, scientific communication, the Ibero-American nursing editors we call in our languages Red Edit. It was created in 2006 by uh, Paho in Washington D.C. Ten years later, in 2016. Uh, during an assembly, assembly of this network, uh, we decided to include or to reinforce the accessibility of the website. Uh, at the same year, as a leader of a research group, I coordinated the process uh, to host, host in its website all the journals belonging to this network. And uh, from 2021, uh, the Reddit website is following its own domain with support from pra Paho Brazil and from COFEN, is that is the Brazilian Council of Nurses. And we have in this in this Ibero-American Nursing Editor Network. 85 journals 
eight five nursing journals distributed in fourteen countries. We have uh, in some countries as Argentina, um, Bolivia, Cuba, El Salvador, and Uruguay, one journal. Uh, two journals in Costa Rica and Venezuela, four in Mexico, uh, five in Chile and Portugal, and six in Spain. In Brazil, we have 45 ju journals, nursing journals. Um, the mission of this network is to bring together all scientific journals produced by nursing from Portuguese and Spanish speaking countries in Ibero-America to promote their growing qualification. And with the goals of establishing homogeneous quality standards, uh, common strategies for indexing Ibero-American nursing journals and common strategies to increase the visibility of knowledge generated by Ibero-American nursing. Um, the website of this network exists to give visibility to journals that have chosen to be part of this network, to serve as a driving force to the union of, union of the scientific publishing leaders and to add value to the work of, and to the product of that collective work. It also, also serves as a source of teaching in scientific publishing, as a hub for aggregating leadership with focus on scientific editorship. This is why in, in this region, in, in, the, in those 85 journals in these uh, 14 countries, nurses, uh, struggle, uh, they, they have the challenge to be uh, perfect professors, perfect um, supervisors for master and, and doctoral students, and at the same time to be as perfect as possible editors or editor in chief or editor as associate editor or belonging to, uh, to a team of editors. We don't have publish, publishers. We don't have to those journals, commercial publisher. So we have the challenge to learn how to be editor in, uh, and at the same time to be professor and researchers. Um, the, the, the journals that want to be part must apply uh, since they have some uh, 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 quality, uh, quality criteria and uh, the, the network uh, um, met uh, it two years to decide uh, uh, and discuss and deliberate on previously agreed terms. And uh, I, I, will, I will share with you one, uh, one activity that was a successful showcase called Expo Red Edit that was created to celebrate 15 years of this network. The, the showcase um, um, was a valuable strategy for strengthening the journals that make up our net network with the aim of the series to provide red edit uh, members having with the opportunity to learn from multiple perspectives, good practices in editorial universe, Please, Agostinho, uh, uh, run the next uh, good practice in the edit editorial universe, interact with, with experienced uh, editors at the same time, expose to the guests 
and the public the greatness of our network and of our uh, editors in, in our regions. Uh, the expo uh, was developed in nine sessions with sim simultaneous translation uh, and brought a series of experiences bringing together editors from global north and south in the area of nursing, uh, considering that the positions of the editors are, are uh, dynamic and uh, bringing uh, together the, them, uh, the most prestigious nursing uh, journals in Latin America in the showcase. Uh, the product of this initiative mm -hmm. is available on YouTube so that the investment can be optimized and absorbed uh, by the interested public. Uh, the references of, of this presentation, can, you can find the last uh, slide. And uh, I want to thank so much my dear friend Diva, uh, Mary Beck, and uh, Barbara Dossey for this special honorable invitation, as well as uh, my, uh, my uh, thanks to the CIFAO and New York University, and my special uh, congratulations to the uh, panelists we had this meeting. Thank you. Uh, all, all of you that uh, for listening my my voice on behalf of uh, Ibero American uh, Scientific Publishing Network. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Costa Mende. Um, a big thank you also for creating space for nurses to come to voice in scholarly journals. Um, so with that, I'll turn back to our colleagues at CFAL for the next step. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we before we have about seven minutes for official time that we have allocated for this session, and we have two questions on the Q and A part. Uh, Deva, would you want to take care of the questions, or should I read them? I, please, you read them, and I'll see. Of course. Uh, I read the question as they appear on the screen. Uh, so the first question is from Byron. And the question is, how many clinical hours does your program require? I believe this is uh, probably going to uh, Donna's question uh, if I, uh, or, or presentation, if I'm not uh, mistaken. But how many hours do your students get uh, in simulation? Uh, feel free, please, if that is uh, related to any of your talk. Uh, Donna, please, just briefly, how okay. many hours? Um, I would say it depends that we formally integrate at least one simulation per course. So that's probably if the course is, runs um, for two hours, they'll get at least 60 hours of, of it, a, an undergraduate per semester, depending on what course they're taking. We're, uh, we're about to make a shift, though and move to about a percentage upwards of at least 35%. We were hiring a new colleague coming from New York University who will manage our simulation center because amongst all the things that we are challenged with, finding clinical sites is becoming increasingly more complex and we have to decide a better way to assume it. And it's not just regular clinical simulation. We're actually beginning to integrate or think about integrating virtual reality. All right, thank you so much. Uh, the next question then is on, uh, that's from uh, Candace, and that is asking uh, Dr. Costa Mendes, if you could please share the link to the, to the Red Edit as people are asking for the link to the website for, for it. Uh, that would be great if you can share the link. And if there is any, any additional information you want to talk about, please. For sure, I will send you. 
All right, so uh, you, you can put it in the chat, uh, please. And the last question that I see on the screen uh, at the Q&A part is from David. And David is uh, from Ghana and it's asking, um, I'm a nurse who have now a specialist in eye nursing. The wage of nursing practice, especially in Africa is very poor, uh, yet the workload is so uh, backbreaking. What measures are stakeholders, especially WHO putting in place to augment the wages of nurses, irrespective of your location? Wow. Anyone? wants to go ahead with the answer. Wow. Oh, that's a that's a big question. We none of us are actually representing the World Health Organization. May I suggest uh, may I suggest that you connect with me on my email diva marie at earthlink.net and I will put you in touch with someone who can answer that question. Again, D E V A M A R I E at earthlink.net and put on the uh, subject line a question from the session two of the Nurses' Voices speaker series, and I'll see if I can help you find the answer. Yes, thank you very much, Deva, for this is a good answer. I hope uh, David can follow up on that. And we have another question coming up that is from uh, Yamima. And uh, I, I just read the question or comment. Uh, good day, wonderful people. Please, uh, will it be appropriate for us to contact these wonderful panel members for membership uh, and other career and education related opportunities? Uh, I think that is Deva, back to you. And of course, of course. Well, we're compiling this a phenomenal list of people. More than a thousand people have registered. And we're doing, we're, we'll be developing ways to stay in touch and ways to carry forward this Nurses' Voices speaker series. Thank you for that question. We will use it to strengthen our cause and uh, we're, we'll be very pleased to stay in touch with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think there is a comment just acknowledging and supporting and uh, appraising the, the session uh, from Elena. And thank you, Elena, for your comment. Um, and uh, I think it's good wishes for for everyone uh, on on the on the session and uh, uh, speakers in particular. Um, I think that's all uh, I see in terms of question in the Q and A part. Uh, there will we have two minutes to uh, for this session. Do you want to make yes. some recap of the session, please? Well, uh, my my nine nine board colleagues are waiting. So if we could have just have them say hello, uh, Dr. Barbara Dossi. And go ahead, Barbie. <laughs> no, speak. Well. Did that do it? <laughs> go ahead, Barbie. It has been absolutely a brilliant session. And I am reminded after 58 years of nursing, I, I found my tribe. I can't think anything else I'd rather done with my life. But what we all have to do is find our voice and really reimagine our social contract with uh, the public. And nursing fits with the public just like this. And we know that. And I will also say in the United States, in Merriam-Webster Dictionary for 20, 2023, the word is authenticity, the new word in the dictionary and the focus. And everything that has happened on this session today is us finding our authenticity, finding our authentic, authentic voice, and staying steady. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh Tess and Falakshi, are you there? No? <laughs> no. And Cyril has left. Elia, are you there? No. We, we will be hearing from our other board members in the sessions ahead. Uh, Ali, I would like very much, if I may, to, uh, to go over just two, three minutes. Oh, Tess, there you are. Wow. Tess, you raised your hand. Can we see your face? Tess? <laughs> uh, Tess will be our moderator for session four. Looking forward to it. Our, our session in February, on February 13th, Tess will be our moderator for the Western Pacific region. Okay, Ali, 
do I have permission to spend, just uh, invest a couple more minutes to close with the Nightingale Declaration for a Healthy World? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And hi, Diva. I oh, just got an. <laughs> hi, Tess. Oh, good. There you hi. go. Good. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. So hello to everyone and Dr. Nikita. It's lovely to see you again, my professor. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Uh, this is such a this is such a love fest. All of this. Thank you. Okay, Tess. Talk to you again soon. Uh, okay. I'm going to close with the Nightingale Declaration for a Healthy World because it was the founding cradle for the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health. And it is indeed why we are doing this Nurses' Voices speaker series and sharing this opportunity with all of you across the world. The Nightingale Decoration for a Healthy World, now available in 13 languages, including Spanish, French, and Portuguese. We, the nurses and concerned citizens of the global community, hereby dedicate ourselves to achieve a healthy world. We declare our willingness to unite in programs of action to share information and solutions and to improve health conditions for all humanity, locally, nationally, and globally. We further resolve to adopt personal practices and to implement public policies in our communities and nations, making this goal achievable and inevitable, beginning today in our own lives, in the life of our nations and in the world at large. Mm -hmm. Florence Nightingale, what did she say to us? We are only on the threshold of nursing in the future which I will not see for I am old. May a better way be opened. May we hope that when we are all dead and gone Leaders will arise who have been personally experienced in the hard, practical <clears throat> work and the difficulties and the joys of organizing nursing reforms and who will lead beyond anything we have done. Please join us with your voice at the Nightingale Declaration for a Healthy World, again in 13 language versions, www.nighvision.net forward slash declaration dot html. And also, FYI, on January 9th, we have our third session, Nurses' Voices from Africa. Save the date, January 9th, 2024. Looking forward to you joining us then. Thank you so much to you all. <laughs> Thank you. Ali, back to you, Ali. Thank you, uh, Debo. Thank you, all uh, the speakers, for a great session. I'm not a nurse. Uh, I'm uh, from the field of disaster and emergency management, but there are lots of interfaces between nursing and, and this field, uh, for sure. So I, I feel very much connected through the discussions made today. Uh, everything you said are, are really important, and um, it's reflective of the importance of the profession and and the the great works that you are all doing uh, i appreciate your 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 comments your points your voices uh, i, I want to really go uh, one on one with uh, each of the comments that you made uh, but for the sake of time i i i, I, I try to uh, not not to go into details but really uh, appreciate appreciate your 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 time and coming uh, to this series this has been a great uh, series so far of course with your contribution from different parts of the world with your uh, your uh encouraging words and also support uh, throughout this uh, this series we have uh, a large number of uh, registration for for from coming from many many different parts of the world of course considering the time zone we we understand how difficult it is to set the time that works for all 
but we had lots of interest. And again, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Deva. Thank you, uh, your team uh, for uh, working and supporting uh, this session. We are really happy from CFAL York uh, to, to be with you and to uh, host and organize this and co-organize this with you. And with that, uh, as I said, we, we will have next session uh, hearing from our colleagues from Africa. And please join us uh, in January for, for the next session. Thank you all and have a very good day or evening and afternoon. Goodbye. Goodbye to all. Thank you. Hasta la vista. Goodbye to all. <laughs>